Hello and welcome to another video focused on Zscaler. This time I'm going to draw a very basic whiteboard. So this will be a Zscaler 101. What does Zscaler do? How do they do it? What are the core products? So I'll be covering ZIA or Zscaler Internet Access, ZPA or Zscaler Private Access, ZDX, Zscaler Digital Experience, and a few other small aspects we'll touch on as we go through the whiteboard. So the goal is by the end of this video, you'll have a pretty solid understanding, at least at a high level, of what Zscaler does and how they do it, how they deliver zero trust access through these different tools and services. So without any more waffle from me, let's get into the whiteboard and take a look. Now most of the time, we're looking after stuff to do with enterprises, businesses, and we have two key profiles for our users, our employees. They normally fall into two camps, managed device employees, and they're normally on a laptop that you give them. So this is my drawing of a, a, a gorgeous thin device. And this laptop tends to be Windows 11. It doesn't have to be. I'll put Windows. It could be Mac, Mac OS. Could even be Linux. If you're lucky enough, you work for a company that gives out mobile phones as well. Might even be just perhaps VIPs or managers or something, but these devices are, are going to be Android or iOS. And then the other type of people are the third parties. The key difference being that they're going to be using their own laptops. And these devices are not managed. So we have no idea what condition these machines are in. They might even be using their own mobiles to try and access your stuff. So I'll put BYOD. Bring your own device, third party. So these are partners that you may want to provide access, but it's a little bit tricky. And I'll explain why and how we make that work in a moment. So what kinds of things are they trying to access? We have the wild west of the world wide web. So the public internet. And you're gonna to wanna to do things here like typical stuff, block, allow. So when you think about websites or entire categories and groups of websites, you might want to say, I just want to block anything to do with Facebook. Or I want to block anything to do with gambling. There's absolutely zero reason why my my people my, who work for my business need to get access to that. Or maybe they do, and then you need allow. We also have warn. So you can allow access to stuff, but just have a pop-up that says, you know, just be aware that this is not a good idea, or this is against company policy, or whatever you want to put in the message. You can warn people too. And then the fourth option, we have isolate, and I'll explain exactly what that does after we cover SaaS. Software as a service, it's 2026 almost. A lot of companies have SaaS. Okay, so you think about 365, ServiceNow for your ITSM. You might have uh, Salesforce for your customer records. All sorts of things that are hosted by other companies. So Microsoft provide this 365 service. It's hosted by Microsoft. And then we have the stuff you do control. So you might have your own IaaS, PaaS, you know, public cloud. I'll put the obvious ones, Azure, AWS, GCP. You may even have some private cloud as well. VMware, very popular one. If I can spell VMware, let's try that again. VMware. Hyper-V, we see that too quite often. And uh, Nutanix, we see that as well, quite a lot, Nutanix. So this is where you're hosting your domain controllers, perhaps other things that you have hosted on premises. Now, even though I say on premises, public cloud is private infrastructure effectively, in the eyes of Zscaler at least, and all become clear in a moment. I'm just gonna give myself some space and move this over to the left a little bit because I'm bringing in now, star of the show, this is the Zero Trust Exchange, ZTE or Zscaler. This is the Zero Trust Exchange from Zscaler, okay? 
So this is a proxy solution. So what we're doing is we're plugging in almost like plug and play all of the things on the right that you're trying to provide access to behind Zscaler and all of the people to the front door at the front. So how does this work? How do we send people to that front door? How do we forward that traffic to Zscaler in the first place? Well, there's a few different options, but in this whiteboard, I'm just going to cover the, the simplest, the, the most common deployment that we see. And that is with the Zscaler Client Connector or ZCC. This is an app that you can put on these devices. It's tamper resistant, it's lightweight. We only have one app when we think about Zscaler. It's not different apps for different things. There's gonna be a lot of capabilities that I'm gonna show you in this video. They're all just modules that are turned on in that same Zscaler app. What does it do? It talks over the internet and it looks for Zscaler. It finds the nearest public service edge or POP. Some people call these POPs, points of presence. There's about 160 across the internet around the world that connects to the closest one the best one it can find. Zscaler says, hey, um, give us a username and password. So, you know, tell us who you are and then some magic happens and we actually broker the connection to your IDP of choice. So you may already have an identity provider. In fact, it's very, very rare that you won't have an identity provider. So instead of reinventing the wheel, uh, we send you to, for example, Entra ID. You may have complex conditional access set up. You might have privileged identity management. You might have privileged access management, just in time access, all of these things, MFA, FIDO2. Why would we make you do it again? So we simply plug in to your IDP. Now, I have actually made another video that explains how that works, which is worth having a quick look at if you want to understand that process in a bit more detail. But essentially, we plug in your IDP and then we send you to your IDP to prove who you are at the front door, the very first step before thinking about what you should be able to access. Now, when it comes to the World Wide Web, the public internet and SaaS applications, we're talking about the internet. Internet access. This lives inside the Zero Trust Exchange. It's called ZIA, Zscaler Internet Access. We actually broker connectivity to these things. Now, when it comes to isolation, I'll come back to this now in a nice purple color. We have the ability to say, for a category. So for example, web category AI ML, all AI ML websites send the user to isolation. So the user can still access those websites. The user says, oh, actually, I actually want to take a look at DeepSeek. Okay, fine. Um, although perhaps that's not a great idea, but in our example, we'll go with it. Cloud browser isolation happens. So we send the request. Okay. You're not even leaving Zscaler's data center. You can have a little look at DeepSeek, but it's going to run in isolation. And what does that mean? Isolation. It just means it's not running on the user's local laptop or on the user's phone locally. It's isolated. It's running in Zscaler's cloud. It's a Chromium-based browser in a container that's on demand, and it streams the pixels back to the user, not that way, this way. Streams the pixels back to their local, local internet browser on their machine. So to them, it looks great. They can still use the website, but it's in isolation. Now, what I keep talking about isolation, what's the benefit in doing it this way? Well we can add extra controls on top to make sure it's secure. Because it's running in Zscaler's data center, you can restrict things like cut, copy, paste. So you think about uploading, downloading. I don't need to upload anything into DeepSeek. That's not a good idea. In fact, I'm gonna apply watermark. So you can access a certain SharePoint site or something. I can see who did it, where from, the public IP address, and a few other details across the screen as a watermark, stuff like that. It's an extra fabric, an extra layer of control and things you can do over the top. It's not just as simple as a block or allow internet access filter type solution. And then we have ZPA, Zscaler Private Access. So this is all your private applications and data. Same agent like I talked about, comes in, says, I'm trying to reach some apps in Azure. Is that okay, cool. But in order to tell ZPA where those things are available, we deploy a little virtual appliance called a connector. This Zscaler connector only talks outbound via 443 to your ZPA, your Zscaler cloud. So super secure. In years gone by, we had to do this with virtual private networks or VPNs. So you'd have this VPN concentrator on your network that would listen to the internet inbound connections and then you'd have to install this VPN client on the endpoints that would then try and find this thing and then you'd be connected to a network which in hindsight sounds like a terrible idea because well you have something externally facing so you've increased your attack surface you're connecting someone 
to a whole network, which introduces the risk of lateral movement. And the whole experience is also just not that great. With ZPA, you don't need to do that. So we have this concept of the inside out connection from the Zscaler connector, and that tells ZPA I can see all of these things, A, B, C, that live here, and I can see all these things as well down here, X, Y, Z. User comes in and asks for Z, it brokers a connection. So there, user comes into ZPA and asks for something in your Azure tenant, it brokers connection like that, great. Now the simplistic way to think about this is this whole solution as a whole is, is your uh, SSE, your Secure Service Edge, or SASE. These, all these different Gartner things that we have now, wonderful. You can also think of this as a SWIG, if you're familiar with that sort of te that terminology, Secure Web Gateway and ZTNA. And I guess if you combine the two, then you're talking like CASB, just to try and help people with knowledge in, in other vendors, other areas of our lovely ecosystem uh, in our industry, try and map their knowledge to what's going on here. But ZIA, ZPA, these two solutions are the core pillars of Zscaler's portfolio of products. These are the core capabilities that have been around the longest. And most of the other solutions use this underlying technology, this underlying architecture. Now, before I talk about a layered approach to adding some more stuff here, I'm just gonna cover the BYOD situation. So we've talked about how easy it is for people with the client to come in and we go and check them against the IDP and then we broker a connection on a per user to app basis and it's all wonderful. What about if you don't have that Zscaler app? You know, I don't manage this BYOD laptop. I have no control. I can't push out a Zscaler client. Maybe you can. Maybe you can send them a link to download it and you know, that's really cool. But if they don't want to do that and you can't, the way that Zscaler provides access for those scenarios where you don't have the client is via a web portal. There are a couple of different web portals and I won't get too deep into this, but both fall into the same kind of umbrella called browser-based access. And the reason there's more than one is because there are different technologies at play that support different protocols for different use cases. So as an example, I'll keep this really simple. We have privileged remote access, which is a web portal called PRA that supports uh, SSH, type activity, VNC, RDP, of course. You might have a third party that needs to RDP to something on your VMware estate. You can do that with Zscaler. So it uses ZPA under the hood. So these have a relationship. And we're still brokering connectivity with this connector that you've already put in. But we're, we're sending the, the uh, third party to your IDP. So they're still getting sent over to your Entra, your Okta. We're understanding who they are, what level of access they should have, and then they see the, the tile, oh, there's that VM that, that I can RDP to uh, in, in Azure AWS or you know, a VM on-prem in Nutanix, for example. And then the other portal that falls under BBA is user portal. Sometimes in some documentation, this is called user portal 2.0, but just think of it as one thing. User portal is 44380, it's HTTP, HTTPS. So if you had a VIP, in your organization, super important person. He's on the beach on holiday on his personal iPad and he rings the service desk and says, I haven't got the Zscaler app on this. Obviously the first thing you'd say is, can you put the Zscaler app on it? And I'm joking. You would say, that's absolutely fine. We have a user portal, which is a web-based portal. You just need to go to this website and you'll better see your 365 or raise a service now ticket or look at a service a Salesforce record in Salesforce, wherever you want to provide access to via user portal. How does that work? Well, it's a URL. That URL can be something that already lives in Zscaler. Think about the certificates related to that as well. Hosted, managed, or bring your own. If you bring your own, then you need access to your public DNS. And that URL effectively has a C name that ultimately redirects them to ZPA. And then the first step is the RDP. So you see how this works. So that is how Zscaler protects access to resources in a user portal, privileged remote access. They're both browser-based access solutions. Now, in addition to providing access to these things with a browser, and you don't need the Zscaler app, is the controls I talked about with CBI earlier. So the cut, copy, paste, watermark. Uh, with PRA, you get some extra bits, like you can record the session, you can prop to the session, and things like that too, which is really cool. Now, the last bits I'm gonna add are a couple of layers. The first layer is a firewall. 
So because we're sending people through Zscaler, it's in line. So it's a perfect position to take advantage of being able to do deep packet inspection, SSL inspection with the firewall as a service. Now this is great. Now obviously not everything's gonna play nicely with deep packet inspection. If you have something that needs certificate pinning, it doesn't like the packets being ripped open, put back together again, say, hey, that doesn't look like how it looked on the way out. That's fine, you can exclude that stuff. But for the most part, especially when you think about web access, everything's HTTPS now. 99% plus of your users' interaction with things out on the wild web is gonna be encrypted. So if you wanna understand what that traffic is, particularly from a DLP perspective, data loss prevention, which I won't go into in this video because easily a session in its own right, as you can imagine. But DLP as well is another layer that can take advantage of this deep packet inspection. Something that Zscaler is in line, so inline DLP, data in motion, very simple to turn that on and start taking advantage of getting that extra value from the proxy platform. You can deploy endpoint DLP to these Zscaler agents. You can use DLP to protect SAS, use DLP to scan what's in your SharePoint online, what's in your data on-prem for data at rest DLP cases. You can even send your emails through Zscaler DLP. So all these things, it's a bit like an onion, defense in depth, these extra layers without any heavy lifting to actually set up and take advantage of. The things that can literally be turned on. The very last thing I'm gonna cover is ZDX. I know this is getting pretty messy now, but bear with me, this is the only thing in green, so hopefully you can still see through this. But ZDX is another layer, gets turned on, Zscaler Digital Experience. It's a digital experience monitoring or DEM solution that uses that same Zscaler app that we installed. So this is also doing ZDX. You turn that on, we have a look at the endpoint. We say, actually, on Bob's machine, it's always using 80% of RAM and memory and uh, CPU and storage and there's always these particular processes running. So we can actually look at the health of these machines and work out what's normal, what's baseline for these machines. We're then looking at the path. So for Bob to access some apps, he's going through Zscaler, hop by hop through Zscaler and then he's coming out here. He's accessing all these different things. We can look at the cloud path that that individual is taking through ZDX, through Zscaler to reach those things. So we can understand, again, what's normal? Is there anything unusual about this? Is there latency at this one particular hop out of the eight jumps that the user's having to do to get there? That could indicate an issue with an IDP, an internet provider or something like that. And then finally, we've got probes that can actually keep an eye on your applications themselves. So we can look at, is there an application issue? The, the idea is to reduce the mean time to resolution. Start by narrowing down the root causes or the, the likely causes of an issue that would impact the user experience and call, cause them to call the help desk. Or you could even have an alert on the Zscaler ZDX dashboard that shows you there's gonna be a problem or there appears to be an issue before the users even start complaining. So globally, you can have this view of like, I've got this office, there's 100 people in it, and all of their machines are, seem okay, but they're all having this extra latency today when they try and use Teams. And it doesn't look like Teams is having an issue because we've got the probe talking to Microsoft. Ah, it must be something to do with the network for that office. So that is ZDX. So fundamentally, Zscaler's got these two core products, ZIA, ZPA, and then you've got all these other things kind of layered on top uh, to enhance the platform. In summary, what we're doing here is reducing the attack surface, we're reducing complexity. I know this looks complex because of my scribbles, but it's really not. We're removing things like point products, remote desktop services, application proxies, all these different ways VPN solutions, all these different ways of providing access over the years gone by can be massively simplified. So we've got this central point of control, security, access. It's near real time to revoke access, which is something that traditionally has been quite hard to do. We're taking the right user to the right application and data on a case-by-case -case basis, again, in real time, looking at risk. And also, there's an opportunity for cost takeout here. So you can reduce the cost, you can remove these different clients for access, these VPN solutions, reduce the requirements for your firewalls and going through those things and connectivity solutions like SD-WAN and so on. So this is Zscaler in a nutshell. I know that was quick and really high level. I hope it was useful. 